we'll just pass it like this. Uh, for the benefit of time, I will lead, let, let, um, uh, ask each one to uh, present themselves briefly. Uh, and uh, the reason I, uh, you know, when Lou and I were starting to think about uh, the program and with Rick we were talking, we were saying, what, what are we going to choose? We really thought that this topic of opioids is so important, so just to kind of soak this in, that by the time we're done, uh, five people are going to be dead. Okay, so seven, every seven minutes, someone dies from an opioid overdose. So I want to thank the brave few that are here, because you're the right type of people that need to be here. And the rest that are, so you can give yourself, you know, a hand, you know, hand for being this. This is important stuff, and that is why uh, these companies that are actually using DLT to solve the opioid uh, epidemic are so important. So I want to thank the panel that came and uh, for you being here listening to this important topic. So Steve, let's start with you. All right. Uh, my name is Steve Huff. I'm the CEO of a company called Preventum, and we're in preventative health. So we focus uh, primarily with a platform that incentivizes uh, millions of people to engage in public health campaigns. Uh, so whether that be obesity or uh, violence against women or smoking cessation, and we've been working quite, uh, quite a lot in the opioid crisis, and we've launched a program with a nonprofit called the Preventum Initiative, and next you'll hear from uh, Jackie on the next panel, but we've uh, partnered with them to launch a program called FIND, which is a uh, drug education program for 14 to 19 year olds. And we use gamification and AI to individualize those campaigns. So um, that's what we're up to. And, and uh, yeah, it's good to see some, some of you again that we've caught up before. Here you go. go ahead, Justin. Um, so I am Justin. Um, I am the head of global business for Block Medx. We are an e-prescribing platform and an analytics ecosystem. Um, and so we predict patient risk, um, patient risk behaviors that might lead to overdoses, ED visits, and such. Um, and there's also a component of uh, automating micropayments uh, to incentivize healthy behaviors. But first and foremost, we are uh, an e-prescribing uh, solution for, for doctors to send uh, prescriptions to pharmacies and then for patients to manage those prescriptions in real time. Um, so a very simple solution, but uh, an integrated one between e-prescribing, PDMPs, and um, I, I do, I know that you dropped a few statistics, but just to kind of give a little more perspective, and we won't harp on this for too long, but um, 70,000 people last year uh, died from opioid-related overdoses, and so that's, it's like a Boeing 737 crashing every single day. That's 9-11 that's happening every two weeks. Um, it's more deaths than the Vietnam War and the Iraq War combined. Um, and so, so we know this is a, right, this is, this is a really pressing issue. And, and, and with the incalculable human cost comes a massive um, direct economic cost, a staggering cost um, that many res uh, different research uh, publications have put at you know, 100 to 115 billion in direct costs. And that's like law enforcement costs, criminal justice costs, things, things of that nature. But it's also led to uh, a lot of, um, of funding. And so broadly speaking, Q3 uh, 2018 saw uh, year to date 11 billion in funding. Uh, so we're on track to surpass uh, last year's record of 15 billion. Um, and so we're, we're, we're in a good place. We have, we know that funding's flowing in. We know that there's legislation coming in. HR 6 uh, was just signed by Trump today, earlier, a few hours ago. And uh, that's a big aggregate bill that uh, is just a holistic approach to um, public health reform surrounding uh, this crisis. And so I'm, I'm excited to talk to you guys about this. Thank you guys all for your attention. I know it's been a long two days. Um, so yeah, I'll, Thank, I'll thanks, Justin. Again. John, please go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, John Kassane. I am a member of the board and investor in a startup called Oriya Behavioral Health. Uh, Oriya has developed a telehealth platform sp specifically for opioid addiction treatment. 
Uh, it inc incorporates all the best evidence-based uh, approaches to including the human uh, interaction as well as leveraging all the appropriate uh, technology to provide a full 12-month 24-7 uh, access and support uh, and monitoring and uh, treatment protocols for opioid addiction specifically. Thanks, John. Stewart, go ahead. Thank you, Alex. Stuart Lackey, I'm the CEO of Solister. Uh, we're based in Middle Tennessee, and we are a healthcare marketplace slash ecosystem built around uh, HL7 Fire. David earlier today mentioned the effort at Vanderbilt. We're actually spearheading that effort with them. So you may see some more on that standardization as we scale the Solister model. Uh, who here has been affected by the opioid epidemic? Either personally, know somebody? <clears throat> My father's an opioid addict in recovery and this subject is near and dear to my heart and we feel at Solister that this is one of the greatest use case opportunities to actually make a difference um, in healthcare. Uh, we all know the statistics how healthcare is broken but what I like to talk about when we do discussions like this is like okay what's really going to fix healthcare and the legacy question yes are people willing to give up some some power to get there but we need real solutions. And, and I think distributed ledger technology offers some of those in terms of audit, track, and trace. But I also believe that there's new incentive models that we can think about around certainly uh, detection, presentation, treatment, and then extending recovery to where maybe that's more successful based on incentives, incentive models. Um, so to that point, we just announced a uh, program yesterday, a partnership with a 501c3 nonprofit called Good Shepherd Pharmacy. This is a community pharmacy based in Memphis, Tennessee, that has active customers, members, no insurance is involved. It's complete direct pay. And for that membership fee of and those thousand patients, they get their medications at no cost or very near to cost. And that's pretty darn exciting. They're going to build a blockchain solution on Solister. And so that's something that um, we're certainly um, excited about relative to the opioid uh, crisis and epidemic and as a solution point. So great to be here and thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you all. We'll, we'll kind of go back like this, Stuart, from you. I'll ask you again, uh, um, besides being a Vandy, go Vandy, you know, it's um, no, no, no. Uh, to, to tell a little <laughs> bit um, uh, Middle Tennessee, what's going on? You know, when we talk to people who are not in the crypto space about blockchain, they're very kind of uneasy. What's this all about? Bitcoin, currencies, drugs, there's kind of in the collective consciousness, mm -hmm. this connection that they're making, that it's not not totally okay. How do you approach either, you know, community leaders or the local government or, or to large healthcare systems? How do you explain the utility of DLT into the opioid solution? How does that fit in? Well, I think everybody wants to find a solution, right? But there's a lot of conflict of interest. Um, Middle Tennessee is, I don't know if many of you know, is the home to more than um, 800 healthcare companies. It's the healthcare co uh, capital of the US. And most people think of country music and Broadway and hockey talk bars, but we actually outnumber, uh, healthcare outnumbers in terms of jobs four to one uh, in, in Nashville and Middle Tennessee. Um, to your question, Alex, it's it's really challenging, but efforts like through Hashed Health, if anyone's familiar with, with that organization, who's done a, a tremendous amount in education and trying to build community and partnerships and, and bringing uh, both legacy institutions and innovation together, first to educate and then try to incubate ideas. Uh, Solister, obviously, we're doing something very similar uh, in terms of trying to create real world solutions. It's been an education process. And so like, for example, Change Healthcare, which uh, is the largest company in the US that manages payments uh, and claims based out of Middle Tennessee um, it has incorporated on um, Hyperledger uh, on Fabric a kind of an internal blockchain. It's a closed permission system, so it's not sexy, it's not open and permissionless and, and kind of all the things we think about uh, at full scale. Uh, but you're starting to see some of those things, Alex. And part of it, true, to be honest with you guys, is they don't want to be left behind. So there's this the, kind of this thing that's happening where they don't want to be left behind, but they do want to be a part of the solution. I think it's an ongoing process in terms of engagement with the uh, enterprise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so education and patience. And John, um, uh, you know, uh, um, I think one of the most interesting things with Oriya Behavioral Health is that it's a long-term treatment. You know, it's not kind of those acute detox and then you go back to the community and surprise, surprise, after two weeks, you're, you're back on it again. Um, how do you see that connection between technology that you use, the virtual care, and the need for high touch in addiction? How, how does that work? Well, it works in that in today's 
day and age, um, not just healthcare, but it, it works in that they have to be combined. Too often we think of the human approach or we think the technological solution to replace the human approach. Um, and what we've learned, um, and again, I'm not on the front lines, I'm not a clinician, but we, the human element cannot go away. Um, I saw there was a great definition of addiction in, in some TED talk and people interested in the subject may have heard once. And the presenter said the, the opposite of addiction is connection. And so human connection is absolutely an important element. And technology, as we all know, because we're on our, so many of you are on your phones right now, connecting to someone. Connect, technology is an enabler of that type of connection. If you use it right, the right time, in the right place, in the right way, it can really augment the, the impact that trained professionals can make on people in need. I, I appreciate that, and, and it, it fits into what yesterday on the, on the main stage we said that the opposite of health is isolation and the need for connectivity, and I know that you guys are on the phone because you're tweeting what a wonderful you know, panel this is, and you're making everybody know, so we encourage you to continue. Um, Justin, Block MedX, e-prescription, interesting, there's this element of DEA and enforcement in all this. How, how does that work, you know, is, is, it, uh, is it something that, that, that is more controversial, um, you know, adversary, or is enforcement part of it? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to kind of figure sure. out how does that fit. Yeah, a lot of people don't think about uh, the regulatory oversight part of all of this uh, as much. A, a lot of the focus is on uh, preventive care and then treatment solutions. But when you think about, um, about uh, enforcement, uh, HR6 recently called for um, a system to flag suspicious orders, right? And how do, uh, how does anyone how does a lot of this happen right now? It's, it's a manual process. A lot of the times you'd be surprised it's really just someone in a back office scrolling through a bunch of Excel spreadsheets and being like, huh, that looks off. Let's, let's look into that. But with, with Block Medx, what we're doing is we're, we're uh, gathering clean data sets and um, we're able to run predictive analytics on it and we're also able to uh, uh, flag uh, statistical outliers and then uh, share that information with the proper uh, law enforcement authorities. So the, the, that, that, that's a really interesting aspect that you have that regulatory and to make sure that we can identify bad actors, but also what I'm hearing between is if you're able to identify aberrant behaviors maybe of patients, then we could kind of send them to treatment and see that. So that's, that's really interesting. So that's actually the, that is the main patient outcome that we're seeking, right? We're trying to stop addiction before it happens. And the powerful thing about machine learning um, is if you have quality data sets, um, you, you can predict these behaviors, these patient risk behaviors, and uh, stop ED visits, stop hospitalizations long before they occur. We often forget that a lot of patients who become addicted, they're, they're not malicious bad actors, they're not junkies, um, they're, they're just, they're people who are taking the pills that were prescribed to them, and then after a certain threshold, they become addicted. And um, most don't even know that they're addicted until it's, it's far too late. Um, uh, th that's really great. Thanks. Thanks so much. And Steve, you know, first of all, thank you for coming and the whole Preventum team all the way from Australia. So I don't want to even imagine what time zone you're in. But talking about that engagement and stigma that has to do with this, uh, you know, really what you're doing with FEND and, and, and involving young people into this. Tell us a little bit about how do you uh, um, include folks to kind of join your ecosystem? So it's, it's really interesting. I, had a, I met with a, a blockchain company in uh, Melbourne, Australia recently, and they had, I think they had done a $30 million ICO last year. And uh, one of the things that the CEO was saying to me is, well, how do you, how do you get customers? <laughs> and I thought, really? <laughs> you didn't figure out your customer acquisition model before you did an ICO? Um, and so that's a whole different discussion about getting your business model straight. But in terms of engagement, one of the things that we know is, we, we like to think of it as using the same tactics that uh, Big Pharma or Big Tobacco would use in terms of 
uh, understanding their audience and speaking to their audience. And a great example of uh, a group that's done this is Truth Campaign with Smoking Cessation. Uh, and now they're doing some great work in, around opioids as well, engaging youth. And one of the things we try to use is that same, those same marketing techniques. So for us, um, those three marketing messages that we, we all know when we're out selling, you know, first of all is um, the altruistic message. You know, there are going to be some youth who want to join FIND and join the campaign because they want to give back. They want to make the world a better place. They want to get rid of opioids. Um, then you have that kind of marketing message of the fear of missing out. And we provide experiences that money can't buy. So one of the things we did this summer is we partnered with a music tour called the Vans Warp Tour. And it stopped at 38 cities around the US and Canada. And we gave away free concert tickets, backstage uh, passes, private acoustic sets. We have a streetwear brand uh, that kids can get, you know, ball caps and hoodies and, and t-shirts and start to wear that brand and be proud about that. So that fear of missing out. And then the final one is what's in it for me. And that's where when you do use gamification, uh, and you know this with the micropayments, Justin, when you use gamification, you're able to, um, you're able to speak to whoever your audience is and say, okay, so what, what is it that you want? What will motivate you? Now, gamification is a big term. It's thrown around a lot. Um, you know, it, it's easy to say, and we were talking about this yesterday, Alex, about, you know, well, if, if you're, you're going to be responsible for your own health and lowering that cost, then shouldn't you share in the, the profits of you being well? And that's a great motivator. Uh, but on a small scale in prevention, gamification can be powerful, and we can answer that question, what it's, what's in it for me? It's not only, though, providing free concert tickets or free swag or a chance to win a free iPad or Amazon gift cards. Those are the extrinsic rewards. And what the research shows is that those will last for so long, but until we have an intrinsic value placed on um, that person motivating and moving beyond the extrinsic and they internalize that, then gamification can fall over. So you have to do both. Jump on that really ahead, quickly. Ahead, yeah, so that's what, what you're talking about is so important. I'm patient, we've long known that patient engagement is the holy grail of medicine, right? It's a $300 billion market. And um, when, when, you're, when you're able to, uh, when you're able to, when it's economically viable to incentivize people with micropayments, then, right, we can codify healthy behaviors. Right. Um, I, it exists as much in literature as, as I guess now, in practice with what you're doing, uh, but, but literature has shown with like a diabetic population that you can increase medication adherence by twofold with as low as like a dollar and 40 cents a day. Um, and so I, I do think uh, it's, it's really cool that you have like a content driven model and, and you're targeting youth and using all these cool little gamification. Yeah, uh, taking that one step further, John, um, with your experience also with the insurance industry and payers, what do you feel is their appetite for these new models of incentives, you know, with blockchain, without blockchain, you know, it's like, w how do you feel, you know, that they're, they're running these huge businesses, they, they do projections to the future, what, what is their appetite for, for going this? Yeah. Um, well, their appetite is huge. Um, I think Justin summed it up, and we all know this in healthcare, that in patient engagement is is the holy grail. Um, as a matter of fact, remember, we did a, uh, you know, we have national, um, national contracts with uh, a couple of the largest national payers, and I'll never forget, one of them said, this, your, your platform is, by far the most clinically sound and technologically advanced we've seen, and we should get this to as, as many members as possible, as soon as possible. The only question in our mind is the extent that which you can engage them. All right, so that's always, uh, so to answer your question is they're very interested. I mean, in the day of um, value-based payments and controlling outcomes and the, um, the importance of personal responsibility and behavior in dictating whether or not your 
your health outcomes are good or poor, which means your cost to the system, including to the insurance company, your employer, or your, your pool, or, or just your own pocketbook, uh, takes a significant hint, hit is, uh, is absolutely critical. So I think all the stakeholders, um, including the insurers who, you know, there's a cynical view of what the insurance insurers care about, but absolutely they are they care about that. Well, well that's, it's, it's good to hear because sometimes, I'm, I'm, especially from a patient perspective and provider perspective, it can be a little bit daunting. Um, Stuart, uh, working so, you know, in, in the crypto space, what would you say, uh, because blockchain can do a lot of things, but w what is the most salient feature from it that you would say is the most helpful or relevant to this opioid problem? Is it like, is it the immutability, the interoperability? The, what, what, what is it when you go and you want to design or sell it? What, what is that feature? Well, I, th I think it's a really good question. Um, and I think all, automatically a lot of people think, well, is it, can you tokenize something here? And that's not the right question to ask, right? It's, it's like, can we leverage the technology to do something meaningful? We already have prescription monitoring programs. I think every state, almost every state has a, has a monitoring well, program, right? States. So we have the technology to track if someone's abusing the system, either if there's a physician that's over prescribing, we see the CDC, you can go to CDC, they have a whole opioid um, kind of venue where you can look at the statistics. We know where the, where the over prescribing has happened over the last several years. We know the history of how this kind of started. Um, and we know patients theoretically that are abusing the system that are dock hopping right going from state to state if in some cases um, I think it is a track and trace I do think it's it's an incentive model Alex of some regard but people have to remember something when somebody's addicted they don't care about incentives they just want the high so you have to think about okay can we do something kind of to I mean Steve and I uh, were at consensus health a couple of weeks ago and uh, Victoria shared some of those statistics you know it's like uh, I mean, what do you do with an incentive model for an addict, right? Um, but I do think there are some incentive models for the physician teams and the rehabilitation teams that could be really interesting to stay committed to the process to keep people clean. Um, the track and trace thing, I think, will continue to get better, though. I think that's still an opportunity to, to connect it all, if that makes and, sense. And, and maybe family and support system. For sure, yeah. yeah. So we have, you know, time is flying so fast, you know, and this is a great conversation. So let's do, like, one more round and leave a little bit for the audience. So, Steve, I know you're moving from state to state tomorrow. Tomorrow you're going to Utah, you have Rhode Island. I was talking to Governor Raimondo. She said, oh, you, well, you must know about Preventum and, and Virginia and all this. Um, is this like a global thing or is this just a U.S. thing? Or uh, yesterday I used the word affluenza, you know, countries that just have too much. Is it a country that has too much things? Well, how, how would you kind of, well, our next, our next uh, panel will be about global impact, but what do you see as a cultural phenomenon? Well, I think it, you know, the U.S. loves to do it, do it big, don't we? I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm originally from North Carolina, but I've been living the last 20 years in Australia. And Australia is a great country to look at things like health systems and, and social impact. And, and because it's such a small population, I mean, we only have 25 million people. Uh, but it has a lot of problems as well. And we've just now had our big 60-minute special, like... Uh, we've had here in the States a couple of years ago talking about the rise of fentanyl overdoses in Australia and how that's now going to pass the uh, ice and methamphetamine over to, and, and, and addiction. And it's scary. Um, and so I think there is a cultural thing here, and we're, we're trying to get to the bottom of this. A part of what we're trying to do with FIND is just basic education. When we started Finn and we did some early research with high schoolers and, and, and asked basic questions like, well, what is an opioid? You know, what happens if, you know, you're, you're drinking a beer at a party and someone gives you an oxy? Um, and fentanyl was considered a party drug. And this is scary stuff. And so this is not like weed or some of the other things. So the other thing we wanted to do is make sure that we're not preaching. Because this is not about us, you know, this is, and this is the whole, the whole argument with blockchain too, is that it becomes a ground up uh, a movement. And that's what we're trying to create. Uh, so I think the social impact is, and I, and I hope the panel uh, next can talk about that, and I think it's huge. But I don't think it's just a problem that's limited to the U.S., but we definitely have made it a, <laughs> we've perfected it. Well. Briefly, briefly, Justin, is it a generational thing? A generational? No, I don't. Um, I don't have any statistics offhand, but we know that doesn't discriminate. We, 
you're right. Um, and, and just to kind of add on to that, uh, it, it is worst in the United States. Um, but we're, we, we know that countries like the UK are not far behind. And um, many um, uh, legislators there have described the situation as being like kind of the like 2014 over here. Um, so we at Blockmatics have actually secured a national uh, pilot test with the government of Taiwan, which is a single payer system. Um, and we're, uh, we're hoping that that's going to be a good proof of concept to bring back here domestically so that when we speak to legislators here, we can show them what's going on. Um, and then just one more thing to add to what Stuart said about uh, the most important part of what can blockchain do, right? Uh, Everyone knows that blockchain is inherently more secure, uh, but that's really important for something for services like like EHRs and, and e-prescribing platforms. Last year, uh, all scripts went down in January, and uh, a lot of hosted sites couldn't access these resources uh, for for days for a forty thousand dollar ransom. You know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our time is almost up. Anyone from the audience want to ask our panel something? Yes. So, so the question, just for the sake of it's taken on video and briefly, and we'll, we'll finish with that. First of all, condolences for your loss. And, and every time we hear it, it just chagrins us. And thank you for sharing. Uh, um, uh, the question was about gamification and how specific and special it can be for addiction. So uh, I jump in real quick. Yeah. yeah. Um, in looking at that question, it's a great question. I think it's um, important for all of us to understand that addiction is a very broad and universal issue with all of us. And um, you, in hearing from lots of addicts, and opioid addicts, addicts uh, in particular, um, but addicts of all types, they oftentimes in recovery trade one addiction for another. And that is how they actually recover. Um, and only in a state of health and clarity while having a, an addiction maybe to coffee or maybe to working out or maybe to lots of other things, can they move themselves to a more balanced and healthy lifestyle? Um, but I think you're absolutely right that tra trading one addiction for another is absolutely part of it. On the Araya platform, we see that um, in, in the, the outreach to people. Um, we see some people become addicted to their therapists. So that can happen. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing, is I guess is a, in a nutshell. Um, it's how you transition people to you know, staying alive and, and living a fulfilled life. And, and I'll just add, um, one of the, the, the big challenges, of course, you know, the, the opioid crisis, if we look at the three kind of big areas that we're, we're addressing is prevention, treatment, and recovery. Um, in prevention, gamification, and particularly in injury prevention, and Jackie, who will be up next, is, is really the global thought leader on using gamification and injury prevention, and her research has been around that. Um, that's, that's actually proven to work, and there's some great outcomes you can get with education and prevention. In terms of treatment and recovery, uh, with recovery, there have been some some, there's been work around things like contingency management uh, for other types of addiction, uh, cocaine, alcohol abuse, and addiction. And there is some exploration in looking at opioids right now and opioid addicts using a theory called contingency management, which is using a type of gamification, but it, it reinforces the behaviors in that recovery and treatment plan, going to counseling, uh, attending family th therapy sessions, uh, showing up to work on time, clean and sober, 
uh, all of those types of activities as a part of uh, recovery. Th there is some early research now happening, and I know Consensus is doing some cool stuff around that as well. Great. Well, listen, thank you so much. Thank you for the panel. And... Uh